All right, ladies and gentlemen, Donnie Money here. I wanted to do a video. I actually wanted to do a home buying seminar. You know, a lot of times I'll reach out to real estate agents and different people within the industry, and I'll try to do things like seminars, etc., and they often don't pan out. But I was thinking, I was like, you know, why don't I just do a video that can last forever where I can help people buy homes? So <clears throat> in case you're tuning in and you think, oh, this is just another mortgage guy, a real estate guy that's trying to sell me a property or get me to go with him so he can make some commission. Listen, at the end of the day, you're going to do whatever you want to do. But if you're watching this video, you probably have questions about buying a house. There is some remnants of concern that you have. You want to buy a house. So what I'm going to do is do my best from my experience, not only as a mortgage broker, but as a financial advisor, as a former real estate agent, as someone who has lost wealth due to not taking over grandmama's property. You, you hear that a lot in different cultures. A lot of people let their ancestors or their great grandparents, parents even, they let the properties go away. That happened to me. Uh, 3303 Fordham Road, Dallas, Texas was my mother, my grandmother's, uh, my father's side, my, my dad's mom. That was her property. Well, that property belongs to someone else now. Had I or someone else in my family decided to do the right thing and take that property over, you know, that's a step toward, you know, creating wealth. Now, maybe it wasn't in a desirable area, but someone always needs to rent, right? As we've seen, equity continues to increase. That means that home values keep going up because your U.S. dollar keeps shrinking. We all know that. Nevertheless, let's get right into it. There's nothing written down, no scripts, no gimmicks, no potions, no lotions. I'm just going to tell you the skinny about buying a home. Whatever demographic you are, this isn't for blacks, this isn't for whites, this isn't for Asians, this isn't for Hispanics, this isn't for anybody except those people that want to purchase a home. All right. So the biggest, let's talk about obstacles to home ownership first. The biggest obstacle that I see with home ownership is mindset. Now, a lot of times people speak, preach, talk about mindset. Um, people sell courses on mindset and all that stuff. But there's a book that I read called Psycho Cybernetics. It, it basically dives into identity. And it made me evaluate my own personal identity. Like I told you the story, I didn't buy my grandmother's house. So I grew up in not so great circumstances. If you follow me, you know that. Uh, nevertheless, but what's your true identity, right? So you see people, not necessarily of other races or demographics, but you see people on one end of the spectrum, one person can come from the same area, same type of background, and another person can come from an identical, similar situation, maybe on the other side of town, except this person has went on and gotten a good job, they got the family, they got the house, they saved, they invested in their retirement, they got investments going. This person is doing well. Well, the other person is not doing so well. The other person struggles day to day just to survive. They're trying to earn income. Um, what do they call it? They're robbing Peter to pay Paul. They're in a lot of debt. They have horrible credit, bad relationship, miserable lifestyle. Well, what's the difference between those two people? The reality is the difference is identity. One person identifies themselves as someone that can go out and do great things or achieve the goals they want. The other person identifies themselves as a character that can no longer or a character that can't make it. It's not successful. That lives a bad life. Uh, maybe they're an alcoholic, drug abuser, whatever, live low, low income job, bad relationships, whatever. That person identifies themselves as such. I've been there. Been a person that's been in a lot of trouble before because I once identified myself or my identity was this fictitious character that really wasn't me. Now, how does this pertain to home ownership? Well, if, you ne if you've been in an environment, maybe you've never seen anyone purchase a house. Maybe you've already heard people talk down on the nice house or maybe it's your mom and dad. Maybe they said, oh, such and such got that big old house. They got all that money for themselves. I don't like them. Or these rich folk on this side of town, that'll never be us. We're not those people. You may say, oh, that didn't affect me, believe it or not. But believe it or not, that actually embeds itself into your psyche.
It embeds it itself into your psyche almost like music. You know how you can regurgitate a song from 30 years ago as soon as you hear the beat drop, right? But it's hard to recite a lesson that you learned from school. Well, those same lessons of negativity and failure and poverty that your parents taught you, your grandparents taught you, they're within your psyche. So the first thing we must do is we must break that identity. We must break the teaching. We must change the teaching that we've had. And to do so is simple. It sounds corny. Affirmations. Read books. Read something educational, something that gets you towards a goal. If you want to learn about buying a house, you want to learn about finances, you follow somebody like me. You want to learn about construction, you go study with a construction person. You want to get closer to God, you go to church and read your Bible. It's simple. But these things must be done continuously on a daily basis to break the programming that you have because that programming, when you were an infant, when you were a baby, you knew nothing. You were a mold of clay. You were a sponge. But you soaked in all the negativity of your environment, all the failure surrounding you, all the poverty mindset, the criminal mindset, whatever mindset it was, it was embedded with you. If it was a successful mindset, Parents that strived and did better. They may have not been rich, but they may have taught you you could do whatever you want. They may have you may have seen them work hard and then still the work ethic in you. Those are the things embedded in your psyche. So to get rid of the negative in your psyche, you have to read adequate books. You, and when I say adequate books, three to five books a month. You can do audio books, that's fine, but they need to be books on self-development, self-improvement, and one of the books needs to be on some subject that you want to master or something that you want to do in your life. So that's the identity. Now, identity plays an important role, believe it or not, in affordability. Why do you say that, Don? Well, when I hop on a call with some people, because I take everybody's call and I try to pour as much information into them that I can because there was no one that, could, that did that for me, Many, many people, they don't have high paying jobs, but we're in a society right now where wages are stagnant. Um, automation is coming in, um, artificial intelligence, um, jobs in general, everything shifted. Uh, 2020 pandemic brought back uh, the great reset, as they said it would, whatever you believe about that. But it's actually here. The dollar is, you know, 82 percent of dollars in circulation right now. We're printing in 20 from 2021 to 2022. And the money keeps printing, so that means your wages are lower. If you earn 50, 60, 70, even $80,000 a year, you may feel like you're struggling. But that's part of identity. What says that, What? where is it written that you have to earn a set amount of income? Now, I know people taught you, again, parents, teachers, go out, get the good job, longevity, tenure, retire, go watch when there used to be pensions and all that good stuff, get your pensions in 401k, which most people don't invest in as a 401k. But who says you have to limit yourself to that? I speak with so many people that have massive skill sets that they have no idea, but then they tell me and then I do a Google search while I'm on the phone, match their skill sets with their current field and their jobs literally paying double. So I would say research your skill set market yourself and understand you're not stuck. Your identity is not in that specific position of the income that you earn. Block out the noise. There is so much that tells you the world is against you. Right now we have, and I hate to jump into this during this seminar, but right now we have politics, red, blue, right? Each side wants you to be on their team. And each side has their own version of negativity to get you on their team. You know, Law 27 of 48 Laws of Power says there's a way of the charlatan that takes a, a true issue and amplifies it so they can get a following, use those people up, get rid of them and blame them for their own failures. That's what's happening in the political realm. So when you watch the news, you may think the world is against you. Believe it or not, that can stop you from growing in life in general. If you start your day or end your day with that negativity, it's hard for you to see the abundance of opportunity that's in front of you. You may not even want to talk to a different culture or race 
because of what you watched on the news or television or heard your friends talk about. It's happened to me, so I know it's happened to you. Whether you're white, black, Asian, green, yellow, it doesn't matter. It happens when you focus or you put your attention towards it. You must guide, you must guard your ears and your eyes to keep your brain, brain clear and keep your heart on the mission. But nevertheless, nothing limits you. You are God's highest form of creation. That's what humans are. We don't think by instinct alone. You have the ability to grow and do whatever you want to do and grow in business, or grow in income, job, whatever you can do it. All right. So that's enough of the identity stuff. Now, getting into a home. A lot of people have issues with. Uh, first of all, let's talk about the different types of home ownership, different types of avenues of home ownership, the type of loans you get. So the first loan, the most popular you probably heard of is a conventional loan or conforming loan. That just means that the banks pretty much and you back that loan. There's no government backing of that loan. Um, these, tip, these type of loans, depending on your income, you can get into a home with as low as 3% down, some cases 5% down, again, depending on your income. These type of loans allow for a larger loan amendment. Uh, right now, I believe it's around 766000 I want to say $552, something like that. But that gives you the larger loan amounts. Now, these type of loans typically require a better standard of credit. Um, not necessarily higher income, but a better standard of credit. Um, so you can't have like your, you know, you don't want to have any bankruptcies or anything like that unless they're like four years old. Late payments are no, no. Um, repossessions, all that stuff. Late, even old medical bills. It's very difficult to get these type of loans approved because again, there's no government entity standing with a war chest of money back in this loan. Right. So if you fail at that loan, banks coming after you. Um, the next kind of loan is a FHA loan, which is although FHA loans don't have a huge amount of the market share because there's a stigma of FHA loans. Uh, real estate agents tend to not like FHA loans, especially sales agents, because they only require three and a half percent down. If you have a minimum of a 580 credit score, if you have a 550 credit score, you can get into a home with 10 percent down. Um, but that comes with a whole bunch of fees. I don't advise that people do that with FHA loans. You get a lot of different programs. Uh, there are different down payment assistance programs, uh, whether it's a local city state government down payment assistance program typically they have you have a minimum of a 620 to 620 640 credit score they give you a cutoff on your debt to income which limits the amount of home that you can buy they also charge different fees and a higher interest rate nevertheless they can be great programs for someone trying to break the barrier and get into a home right the goal is home ownership and we'll get into why you may think home ownership is valuable, you know, towards the middle of the end of this. And I'll try not to keep you guys too long. I'll try to go through this information quickly. So these FHA loans require three and a half percent down. Now, the tricky part about FHA loans, of course, they have mortgage insurance that stays with you up to 11 years if you can gain 20 percent of equity in the property. Um, otherwise, you'd be refinancing into a conventional loan. Uh, if you wanted to get out of the mortgage insurance earlier. So be very careful though. Right now, the FHA, uh, Federal Housing Administration, they lowered the cost of mortgage insurance significantly last year, which in some cases, depending on your credit score, can be lower than conventional. Now, you can put as much money down on a FHA loan as you want to, but the minimum requirement, like I said, for 580 credit score is 3.5% down. If you're doing one of these down payment assistance programs, there are some stronger, like I'm a broker, so sometimes we have lenders uh, I have right now that'll do one that don't have like the annual median income cut off. That means you have to be a, at a certain amount of income. They don't have those uh, limitations. They don't give you the DTI debt to income cut off that you would with a standard and the fees. They're still going to give you a slightly higher interest rate is what it is. You, nothing is free. So if somebody told you down payment assistance was free. They lied. Most of these programs want to lock you in for three to five years uh, when you're going with the FHA loan, which means if you intend to sell, you have to figure out a way to pay back that actual 
grant, loan, whatever they give you, you got to pay it back. Typically, that's done with equity. You know, right now we've seen hyper equity. So a lot of people have moved and just paid it at closing with the equity in their home. But if you don't have the adequate equity, then you have to, you know, pay that. Now, a lot of those programs also are going to give you a forgivable period, three to five years. That means if you make 36 payments on time, they forgive it. You don't owe it anymore, which is pretty good. That allows you to refinance out of that loan when rates are better. But there are so many different options. But nevertheless, three and a half percent down. Now, the tri another tricky part about a FHA loan is the escrow holdbacks. So with an FHA loan, you cannot, like a conventional loan, you can waive the escrows. Your escrows are your property taxes, homeowners insurance held up front. T depending on what state you're in, it could be anywhere from three months, six months. On a new construction home, I've seen 12 months. So that means that lump sum of money is now part of your closing costs, along with things like your title fees. Um, piggybacking, uh, in, within home ownership, there's some upfront fees that you need to know about. And your realtor should discuss this with you. But typically, you're going to have to put your money into escrow to get your house on the contract, right? You find a house that you like, you put anywhere from 1% to 3%, which is standard. If you're looking at a luxury home, it could be anywhere from 1% to 10% in escrow that's held by either a title company or an actual law firm, depending on your state. Like Georgia, they use law firms. So that actual money is towards your down payment. So it's not extra money. So that means that it's subtracted from your total down payment. So if your down payment was $20,000 and you put down $5,000 in escrow, your down payment now at closing, the obligation you have to bring is going to be $15,000. Next thing you have to pay for is things like inspections. It could be a pest inspections like wood bearing insects, uh, termite. You could have a septic inspection if you live like in a rural area or if you live in, moving into an older house. Foundation inspection if you're buying an older house or an area that's known for sinkage or houses falling apart, cracks in the foundation. Um, your appraisal. Your appraisal is what lets the bank know the house is worth what it is so the bank will finance it by extending you a loan. Uh, many different things can come up with an appraisal, but you guys can ask me offline about that. Just text me or whatever. Uh, phone number 602-642-6554. I work every day. Nevertheless, that's the only tricky part about an FHA loan. Um, now, understand, though, with all loan types discussed right now, because the market is so rough with interest rates. And if someone's selling their house, even if it's a builder, they want to sell that property. They need to sell that property. It costs them money every day to keep that property. So they're actually, in many cases, giving you closing cost assistance. Uh, with a VA loan, you can get up to 4%. Um, that's 4% of the purchase price of the house. They can go back to pay off. Even with VA, if there's excess, they can pay off like debts you have at closing. It's crazy. VA is awesome. But with FHA, they can give you up to 6%. That pays all this stuff we talked about, the escrows plus the title fees. And you can use it to buy down your interest rate, whether it's permanently or short term. That just means you get a lower interest rate, i.e. lower payment. Never pay for that yourself. Let them do it. Depending on how much money you're putting down with a conventional loan, whether it's from 3 to 6 percent, 9 percent, 15, 20 percent, they, you can get up to 9% in seller's concessions for the higher amount that you put down. Uh, typically, 3 to 5%, you can only get 3% in the concessions with conventional. But one thing I didn't say about conventional loans earlier is with a conventional loan, you can waive escrows if you got really great credit. That means you're responsible for the homeowner's insurance and property taxes yourself, but that means it lowers your financial obligation at closing. So do as you may. Never want to give advice on that. It's up to your personal situation. Next type of loan, VA loan. VA loans are awesome. First thing about a VA loan, 100% financing. That's right. That means the VA loan, your payment, your down payment is covered. Closing costs, closing costs are not covered. However, you're going to get seller's concessions for that in this market. Don't worry about, worry about that. You got to get real to your fine. There is no limit like the FHA. Uh, maximum loan amount for FHA is around 400, let's just say 467,000. VA, it mirrors the conventional loan limit. You can have multiple loans with a VA. Let's say you buy a house this year and it's a VA loan. 
You can buy another house in two years if you need to move or a year if you need to move as long as it doesn't reach a certain amount and you still have entitlement left. That's the amount of money that you have left that can go towards the purchase of another house. Now there is a funding fee. The funding fee is a percentage. I believe right now it's 1.76%. That's rolled into your loan. It's not mortgage insurance, but it's kind of like mortgage insurance. But if you are a 100% disabled veteran, you don't pay that funding fee. Um, yeah, so VA loans are pretty strong. Um, VA appraisals are tough. The VA appraisals, tough as in good, the VA appraisal sticks with you, not the home. Um, what else about VA loans? VA appraisals can be contested. Like uh, it's called the tide water. There's a question about the value, no headache. You just put in a tide quarter, your, the realtor sends in the comps and the appraiser reassesses the determination of value. Um, VA loans, VA appraisers, appraisals in my experience, they've been great, right? Unless the house has major issues or is ours falling apart, but they've been pretty awesome. Uh, VA loans, again, are great for our veterans. Now, there's no credit score requirement for a veteran, but understand if you're below like that sweet spot of like that 580, the lenders are going to charge you for the interest rates. So understand, like for example, let's say you're at a 520 credit score. You can get approved, it's called a manual underwrite. You send in documents, 12 months of your rental history, all that good stuff, deeper background, maybe more W-2s, et cetera. But you can get approved, but they're gonna charge you for whatever interest rate you get because the interest rate is so astronomical that you have to be charged for it because essentially you're buying down the highest interest rate. But again, you can use closing costs, uh, assistance or seller's concessions, which is that 4% from the seller to help with that. Um, USDA loans, that's your rural home, that's your rural home loans, 100% financing. Now there are typically debt to income cutoffs with that, like that mirror are actually lower than conventional. I didn't say that earlier. Conventional has a lower debt to income than all. So your back end, which is your total household obligations after adding the mortgage with conventional is typically around 50%, but with a convention, with a, um, USDA loan, I've seen 43%. So you can buy less, but they will give you that 100%. And typically these houses, these homes are lower costing because they're in rural areas or they're in communities that are being revitalized. So the USDA loans can be great. They were really popular in Texas back when everybody was moving to Aubrey, Texas back from 2000, I wanna say 16 until early 2020. After that, gone because they reached a certain population density. I don't know the populist density because I don't do a lot of USDA loans, but there is a certain population density requirement. Um, what else? So many ways to get into a home. The down payment assistance programs we cover. Uh, the conventional loans, they have a 1% assistance program, which really they're giving you up to $4,000. Uh, different lenders do that, but you have to be 80% or below the area median income. So that means you're just buying a lower cost in house and you have to have lower income, but this can help people break the barrier. Uh, people ask questions like, um, I don't make a lot of money, but my dad lives in California and wants to co-sign or co-borrow on the loan with me to help me get in. Yes, you can do that. Uh, people say, or what I've seen, car payments. People are paying, are, the person with the good credit is maybe have a couple of kids and they have car loans for them. Well, what they're doing is if the kids are paying or whatever relative is actually paying out of their bank, bank account over 12 months, then we can remove that debt from your actual DTI, which allows you to buy more home. Speaking of car payments, for every $100 in any type of payment you have, it's revolving whatever, car loans, credit cards, student loans, for every $100 you have in payment, it reduces your buying power by $20,000. So think about it before you go buy that $1,000 uh, car payment, which I know is hard because rates are higher. I mean, even a Honda, brand new, is gonna run you about 50. I know that's crazy. This is, we're here now, great reset. Nevertheless, I know I'm missing something. This is what happened when you do these videos off the cuff. Um, 
Let's see, we went over the DTI requirements, we went over VA, FHA, conventional loans, USDA, uh, down payment assistance. Oh, the basic thing, what do I need to get into a house? Um, simple, you need to have a job, two years on that job, two years doing the same thing, not necessarily the same industry. If you're self-employed, you need to have been self-employed for three years. This gets tricky though. You don't want to have a bunch of write-offs because you want to be able to use, we want to be able to use your, um, we want to get you a good DTI so you can actually afford a house. Now there are bank statement loans for those that are self-employed. Typically they cut you off at a, when I say they, I mean the lender, they'll give you a 50%, um, they'll cut off 50% of your income based on the bank statement. We just gotta get a CPA letter to prove it, that what your true income is. Basically your CPA will say, well, uh, he actually, his expenses or her expenses are only 25% of the income. That allows you to buy more, but those programs are typically anywhere from 15% down on up when I say down, I mean down payment, plus still your standard closing costs. No mortgage insurance, but they're going to charge you a higher interest rate, so be prepared for that. Um, jumbo loans. Jumbo loans are just any loan over the conventional conforming limit. That $766,000 we talked about. Uh, what that means is it's not a conforming loan. Conforming just means standard right anything outside of 30 years and over that that limit is not standard now with jumbo loans they're tricky they're structured differently they typically require 10.01 percent down minimum but there are multiple programs so i'm gonna let you do 15 percent 20 percent 25 percent depending on your credit profile how much money you want to put down the type of interest rate you're looking for the risk for the bank Jumbo loans typically come with a uh, slightly higher interest rate than a standard conventional loan. Uh, the way we combat that on my end as mortgage brokers, we have a cap to the commission we can make anyway, which automatically gives Mr. or Mrs. Buyer using a jumbo loan a discount on their interest rate. You also have a strategy depending on what lender you're using that are matching um, discounts as well they're lowering percentages for people because honestly we all want the business so <clears throat> so even me i lower my commission i typically take about five thousand dollars on a jumbo loan right you'll say you only take five thousand yeah because i get to get that network of people and i get to help all their friends and family and i get to go into a multi-million dollar house with my client and celebrate with them i mean that's kind of pretty that's pretty awesome for me uh, just different things, different plans I have, side note, for the future for other businesses that I'm starting. But, yeah, so jumbo loans, I mean, if you want to have that discussion, we can talk about it. Because on the surface, it seems like rates are really high. And believe it or not, whether you're in that position or not to buy that million-dollar home, uh, people are rate-sensitive when they're, when they're financing the home. Doesn't matter who you are. Um, we covered mindset, we covered identity, how to get in the house, your W-2s. Oh yeah, so you needed two years W-2s to get into a home. Um, if, it's, if you're self-employed, you need three years to have been in the business for three years and two years of tax returns, avoid write-offs. Um, what else do you need? Two most recent pay stubs if you're a W-2 employee, uh, two most recent bank statements uh, or whatever and whatever wherever you're getting your down payment from um one other thing i forgot gifts gifts are allowed for down payments gifts are allowed from family they say friends but it's sometimes it's kind of difficult to prove those i've gotten it done before but typically you want to get a gift from the family or some type of community organization like a church but that can be used for your down payment as well so that can help you get into a home so if you got family that want to pull funds together they can definitely help you. I mean, there's so much to it. We can keep going on and on. There's so much to the home buying process. As you can see, I kind of just, that's why I didn't write it down because when I write it down, you only make it through one topic, but I really wanted to touch on identity, which is the most important part because I want to help you get your mind. I want to help you focus on achieving your goal and once you focus on getting your goal and get that trash out of your mind your ears and cut off sorry uh we're gonna splice it back together but yeah i can help you buy a home i don't really care if you use me the thing is like i said 
I felt something was just on my mind and my heart to give you guys this information because if I wait around to do these videos or do these seminars with realtors, it's probably never going to happen. And there's a lot of knowledge. I mean, some of you may have questions like, why should I buy a house when I'm single? If I'm single. Some of you may be happy living in an apartment. Listen, we're all going to get old. Buying a house or owning a house gives you one thing, equity. What does equity mean? Equity allows you leverage in the future. Most people don't have a retirement account. White, black, whatever. They ain't got it. They don't have it. Owning a property, you can do two things. You can own a property, it goes up massive amount of equity. You can sell it, live out your retirement years, sell it, put the money into an annuity, um, let that structure pay you over time. Yep, until you die. There are different ways. We're not going to go into that, but I do that as well. But I do that in face to face seminars. But that's a way. Or reverse mortgage. People say, oh, reverse mortgage is bad. Yeah, but if you got family that's not going to buy your house, Reverse mortgage allows you to get paid for staying in your house and keeping it up, plain and simple. So you owning a house can give you leverage in retirement. Jobs are going away, artificial intelligence. You see the writing on the wall. And when you get old, who wants to work? I mean, no knocking to people that work over 65, but the, most people, most people that work over the age of 65 or not work, because a lot of us are gonna still remain and stay self-employed because you don't work, you die. But a lot of people that are maybe a Walmart greeter or you know something like that, they're not doing that by choice. There may be some, but most people aren't doing those type of jobs by choice in their old age. So owning a home can be benefit. You might be the trendsetter that changes the trajectory of your family. And listen, I don't like the great reset idea. I want to beat them, whoever the power is, at any way I can. And one way to do it is home ownership. I'm going to tell you right now, um, Invitation Homes, I did a video on it. They're going to invest 600 to one. And this is what they said. It's in their annual report. 600, to one, 600 million to 1 billion in U.S. residential properties in 2024 and 100 to 300 million in co-ventures co in U.S. properties. There must be a cutoff of what they could do by their sales, which is why they're sneaking it in that way. So Invitation Homes is the one that bought up all, the, all those properties in Arizona, Texas, Georgia, Florida. They got their imprint everywhere. That's what they do. They take your properties and turn them into renters. What are you gonna do? You wanna be a renter? That's fine. You wanna grow equity? That's fine too. The future is, and listen, home ownership, and then I'll wrap up. Home ownership is not the only way to wealth or success. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been a financial advisor doing money management. Otherwise, I still wouldn't be a life insurance producer doing uh, index universal life policies and annuities for people that call me. I don't even solicit it, they call me from my background. Because there are so many buckets. Stock, stock investing. There's so many buckets, but you got to secure all of them in the, at the right time in the right place. Everybody doesn't have a bunch of money to dump in the stocks and everybody can't take the risk to dump it directly in the stock market. So I hope this helps. I actually hope it was some value to it. If it was, please just do me a solid and share it to your network. Again, I am Don Anderson, but I go by Dunny Money. The DFW, Dallas-Fort Worth, that is where I'm located, right here in South Lake, Texas. However, my team and I, we can help in 46 states. We are adding D.C. and New York here shortly. Um, yeah, I'd love to help you if you have any questions. But I, again, I always got to say who I am and what I do. But I didn't do this video to make any money. If you want to call me, text me, whatever, 602-642-6554. I'm out.